In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on Tactics. Chaplain's Report today comes from the book of Exodus. But before we get into it, I, I do want to give you some context and sort of how I came about coming up with this Chaplain's Report. I don't know how many of you have seen the movie Woodlawn. It's been out since 2015, so about four years now. Great movie. I really enjoyed it. I actually got to see a special screening of it in Birmingham with Glenn Beck's people at the uh, All Lives Matter march. I remember uh, very distinctly it was in, in Birmingham at the BJCC that we got to see a special screening of it before it even came out in theaters. And for those of you that are unfamiliar with it, uh, it focuses on Tony Nathan who's a very famous tailback, played for Alabama. I mean, uh, had a lengthy, I think about a 10-year career in the NFL, so very celebrated athlete. And what's so important about him is he was the first real black superstar. I mean, in college football, in the South, you didn't really have black superstars. You had a handful of black players here and there, maybe. But Tony Nathan, he's the one that really, I mean, just, shot off like a rocket. And I mean that sort of in the sense that he did that on the field, but I'm also meaning in the sense in, in popularity and that kind of thing. So it's the story of Tony Nathan, which is a phenomenal story. And it's, it's based on his real life experiences and the characters are based off of real people. And what's so great about the narrative is that it is very centered around his Christian walk and how that kind of propelled him forward and helped him through that very difficult time where there were a lot of people that wanted him to succeed, but there were a lot of very loud people that wanted him to fail just because he happened to be black. And so it's a, a phenomenal movie. I cannot recommend it highly enough. But one of the things that it does that I think is important is it starts at the 16th Street Baptist Church. It starts with the church bombing and moves on from there. It doesn't shy away from the fact that at the time, Birmingham was a very divided city, and the issue of race was a big part of that. It was the primary driving factor behind that division, actually. And there was a lot of racial animus. And by the time Tony Nathan comes around, it's no longer the 60s, it's the 70s. And so they've moved on from it a bit, but a lot of those old wounds are still very fresh. And there's a lot of animosity really on both sides. Some of it righteous indignation, some of it not deserved. But either way, you're seeing a lot of division where there should be love and unity. And by the end of the movie, you see a lot more of that love and unity primarily because of Tony and his influence on other people and the sharing of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It makes a change in that community and it really shows throughout the course of this film. But... There is a phenomenal scene between Bear Bryant, who's played by John Voight, and John Voight does a very good job of playing Coach Bryant. I don't much like Coach Bryant because I'm an Auburn guy, but you, you know. But Coach Bryant is there with Tony. He's recruiting him. This is when Tony's still in high school. And this is not long after an incident where some racist people threw a brick through his window and almost hit his little brother. And he doesn't know whether or not he wants to continue with his football career. He doesn't know if he wants to go to the University of Alabama and try to make a difference and try to break down some of those racial barriers. And he's already become a superstar in high school. He's already sort of a name that's on everybody's tongue. And there's this just phenomenal scene where he's thinking about giving it all up because he's afraid for himself and he's afraid for his family. And he says, they threw a brick through my window. It almost hit my little brother. And that was because of me. He feels personally responsible for that. And then in reaction to that, Coach Bryant says, I was passing by a field today. There were kids playing football. And there was a little black boy 
wearing a number 22 jersey, Tony's number, and had his held, head held high. That's also because of you. And it's just a really powerful moment. And it really reminds me of a Bible story. You see, because often, even when we're doing good, evil finds a way to make it hard for us. Even when we're doing the right thing, we're doing exactly what we're supposed to do. Evil finds a way to try to get us to quit, to stop, to turn around, to just give up. And the story that jumps out at me is when Moses went to deliver God's message to Pharaoh. He said, you need to let my people go so that they can go and worship God and be with him because they're his chosen people. He set them aside for this. You can't keep them in slavery like this because God has ordained them to go out and worship him. And Pharaoh's immediate response is, oh, you want to let my slaves go, do you? so that they can't work for me anymore? Okay, how about this? We're not giving the slaves straw to make bricks anymore. They can go get their own straw. And by the way, the quota for the bricks that have to be made is going to remain the same. In other words, you're going to have to now go gather the straw out of the field yourselves, but you still got to make the same amount of bricks with the same amount of people in the same amount of time. Basically, what Pharaoh was trying to do is says, uh, I don't want to hear anything about this anymore, and your people are going to go after you because you've made this request to me. And by the way, it worked. Let's look at Exodus 5, 19 through 23. The foremen of the sons of Israel saw that they were in trouble because they were told, you must not reduce your daily amount of bricks. When they left the Pharaoh's presence, they met Moses and Aaron as they were waiting for them. They said to them, May the Lord look upon you and judge you, for you have made us odious in Pharaoh's sight and in the sight of his servants, to put a sword in their hand to kill us. Then Moses returned to the Lord and said, O Lord, why have you brought harm to this people? Why did you ever send me? Ever since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has done harm to this people, and you have not delivered your people at all. Now, this is a fascinating moment because this is Moses crying out to God, God, what's the deal? I thought I was here to liberate these people. I thought I was going to come in here, tell Pharaoh what you told me. I did exactly what you asked me to do. And the only thing that's happened is I've made the lives of my own people miserable. The only thing that's happened is Pharaoh got mad at me and has made life harder on them. You haven't delivered these people. You've made their situation worse. What's the deal, God? It's such a human response. And I say that knowing that I would have probably done exactly the same thing. Moses is stuck in a situation where he doesn't have hindsight. He doesn't know how God is going to deliver Israel. All he knows is God said, Go say this to Pharaoh, I will deliver my people. That's the only details, really, that Moses has been given. And he went and did exactly what God told him to, and God still hasn't delivered the children of Israel, and now their lives are a lot worse. And so, just like Tony, Moses did exactly what God asked him to do, and now his life is a lot harder. Now the people hate Moses, and they want him gone. He's being despised by the very people he came to rescue. Kind of sounds like a certain savior we all know, doesn't it? Reviled by his own people. You see, Moses got a little taste of what it was like to be God. He didn't get the full bite, but he got a little taste of it. And I think that that's humbling information to have. That sometimes when God has asked us to do something, whether it's bring the gospel to people or to be kind to our enemies or to love those that persecute us, and it's really hard and it doesn't seem to be making a difference, there's times where we are tempted to just give up because clearly what we're doing isn't working. We've done everything God asked us to do. It's just not working out the way we thought it would. And I just imagine God sitting up there like, uh, welcome to my world. I mean... In Jesus' case, left heaven, the most perfect place that has ever existed, 
to walk amongst human beings so that he could be murdered and killed by his own people that were supposed to welcome him and love him. And when we put ourselves in that scenario, when we sort of stack ourselves up against that, it's understandable that Moses felt like he was being punished for doing what he was supposed to do. And that's how life is. Sometimes you feel like you're doing the best that you can, you're doing everything you're supposed to do, and even then, you were kind of hoping that once you started doing that stuff that your life was just going to be on cruise control and everything was going to be easy after that. Moses was taking down the most powerful nation on earth. It wasn't going to be easy. It never was. It was never going to be immediate. And yeah, there were people that really didn't like Moses for doing what God asked him to do. Just like there are going to constantly be people that really don't like us for doing what God asked us to do. That is a given. There's a reason that there was only one apostle that didn't die a natural death, and he died in exile on an island. It's a very human response to do exactly what Moses did. And to say, God, what's the deal? I did what you ask, and this stuff is not happening fast enough. It's not happening on my timeline. I'm not seeing the results that I wanted. And to look at all the bad things that have happened, like that brick being thrown through Tony Nathan's little brother's window and almost hitting him because of the good things that he did, and say, Lord, I'm trying here, but all this terrible stuff is happening. And the great thing about Coach Bryant's line right there is, yeah, but you're kind of ignoring all the good stuff that has happened because of the good that you've done too. And so that's really where I think we ought to do, uh, where we ought to focus. Sometimes we can't see it just yet, just like Moses couldn't see his people liberated just yet. I'm sure there were a lot of people in Israel that even when he's getting dogged by the foreman here, there were a lot of children of Israel, I'm assuming, I don't know for a fact, the Bible doesn't tell us, I'm assuming that there's a a good amount, maybe a minority, but a good amount of the children of Israel that are looking at him and saying, we finally have hope again. God's actually doing something to deliver us now. Our prayers have been heard. And eventually we know that here we are thousands and thousands of years after Moses' death talking about his great faith and all the good that he has done for the world. And so... We always have to look at it from the perspective of, yeah, maybe some bad things happen because we're standing strong and doing the right thing, but ultimately there's a greater good that happens. There is a greater plan that is in place that we can't see all of it yet. That's really what hope is. Stay the course, friends. Now, y'all know that I am a big believer in personal liberty, and that means I think that you should be free to decide for yourself whether or not you like this video and subscribe to the Tactics YouTube channel. However, I will say this. You know who else never subscribed to my channel? Hitler. So the way I see it, you have two options. You can either like this video and subscribe to the Tactics YouTube channel, or you can be like Hitler. Totally up to you.